we are going to uh, take our Bibles and turn back to that scripture reading portion, the 103rd Psalm. You know what I've done? We're going through the, the book of 2 Corinthians normally on Sunday mornings. I just have flip-flopped it today. We'll do the next section in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians in our PM Bible study. So you want to miss that. You want to keep uh, in tune to what God has for you and for us in that passage. But today I thought in light of Father's Day and uh, that last week we were in the first 11 verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where we read that wonderful statement about God in the third verse. You remember it? We were talking about why God allows you and I to hurt. And we notice that that uh, title for God there. He is the God of all comfort, and he is the what? The Father of mercies. And so I want you to turn here to the 103rd Psalm, because this really, I think, expounds for us what the Father of mercies really entails. I read uh, about a man that was arrested for armed robbery, and he stood before the judge, and uh, the judge asked him how he pleaded, and he told the judge, I'm guilty, but I, I, I plead for justice. And the judge replied to him, you don't want justice, you want mercy. You know what justice is? Justice is you get what you deserve. You get what's coming to you. Mercy is the opposite. Mercy is to not get what you justly deserve. You know, normally dads aren't as quick to dole out mercy to their children as mothers are. I mean, I know how it was in the home that I grew up in. My dad, uh, whenever... I got into trouble. Uh, I always went to my mom first <laughs> because I knew I would get mercy from my mother. I wouldn't get mercy from my dad. So when I see this title for God, the father of mercies, I'm really rather stunned by it because that wasn't my experience with my earthly dad. Father of mercies. Our God, don't misunderstand me, our God is certainly a just God. God will always judge evil. May not be the way we think he should or when he should, but he's just. God will always judge evil. But at the same time, our God is merciful. And Psalm 103 expounds the mercy of God to us. And that's where I want to have you concentrate with me this morning. I would say this. The first five verses are about God's mercy on a personal level. And uh, verses 6 to 19 are God's mercy on a national level, that is Israel. And then the um, 20th to the 24th verse is God's mercy on a universal level. We don't have time to concentrate on all three parts of this psalm, so I'm just going to take the first point. God's mercy to you and me on a personal level. Let's pause and pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this marvelous psalm. In fact, the whole Psalter is just such a blessing, and this one in particular is so special, and I pray that you would uh, it would cause us to have our spiritual hearts open and that we would receive precisely what you want us to get from this, these verses. Thank you, Lord, for it. We just ask that you would especially speak to the hearts of dads that are here. Lord, we, we want to be the kinds of fathers that bring you glory, that please you, that uh, do the will of God. We don't just want to bring children into this world. We want to bring them up in your nurture and admonition. 
use Psalm 103 in our hearts and in the hearts of every single person, man or woman, boy or girl, that is listening this morning. We thank you for your saving grace, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the precious blood that we've sung about, that you shed for us, that we might then have sin forgiven, that we might have life eternal. Just pray that Jesus would be exalted, for we pray it in his name, that is for his sake. Amen. So let's look at these verses. Really, the whole psalm is a psalm of praise. And it begins with uh, praise on a personal level here in the first five verses. Look at how it begins. He says in verse one, bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Verse two, bless the Lord, O my soul, repeats it and forget not all his benefits. Notice how it closes in verse 22. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So the, the Psalm, 22 verses, 22 letters, by the way, in the Hebrew alphabet as well, not coincidental, but uh, it begins with, bless the Lord, O my soul, and it ends with, bless the Lord, O my soul. I want to talk about blessing. You know, everyone wants God's blessing. But if you look at verses 1, 2, and then that 22nd verse, you'll find that it's about us being a blessing to God. We are to be blessing God. Bless the Lord, he says. Bless the Lord. You know what it means to bless the Lord? It means to delight his heart by your expression of love to him and your thanks to him for all that he is and all that he does. And I put it in that order. You should be thankful and blessing God, first of all, for who he is before you even talk about what he's done. Because he has only done what he's done because he is who he is. You follow me? Bless the Lord. You and I are to be a blessing to God. Isn't that amazing that we can be a blessing to God? Obviously, all blessing flows from him. But as a result of the blessing that we get from God, it overflows out of our hearts back to him. It's reciprocal. And we are to bless the Lord. Dads are pleased when their children simply thank them and love them without asking anything from them. You know, we can always tell when our children are trying to manipulate us into getting something, right? Butter us up. You know, the wonderful thing is when a dad gets an expression from his children of love and gratitude, where they want nothing, but just to be a blessing to him. It, it warms our heart. It's, it's, it's nice we have a day out of the year when that happens, but it's nice when it happens just organically on its own. True praise is from a grateful heart that it sincerely wants to glorify and to please the Lord. Bless the Lord. And I want you to notice how we are to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, your soul, your soul life. This is body. We have soul inside of these bodies. Our soul is how we have communicative ability. Uh, it, it's really the real you is your soul. And so out of your innermost being, he says, look at it in verse one, and all that is within me, bless his holy, your whole being, your whole inner being is to be focused on blessing God. You know what the first and foremost commandment in the Bible is? You're to love God with all your being, with your soul, with your mind, with your strength. You're to bless the Lord 
with your whole inner being focused on God. It means that you praise by being prepared to do what you know God wants you to do. There's at least 10 times that the word all appears in this psalm. He says, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. It's a call for total commitment to God. All that is within me. Total surrender and commitment to the Lord. So personal blessing, with all your being, for what? Look at verse 2. And forget not all his benefits. Blessing from your being or how you are benefiting. How God is enabling you to benefit. Forget not all of his benefits. You know, one of the spinoffs of the fall is that fallen human nature naturally forgets. They for, uh, we naturally forget all the goodness of God, all the benefits of God in our lives. And we naturally focus on the negatives. We focus on the discouragements rather than the, the positives and the encourage, uh, encouraging benefits of God being at work in our life. The book of Deuteronomy, the second law giving. It's the book of Deuteronomy is addressed to the second generation of Israelites. The first generation in the 40 years in that wilderness wandering, they dropped dead. And so in Deuteronomy, Paul or uh, Moses rather is giving instruction to this new generation, their children and their grandchildren. And at least 14 times in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses exhorts Israel to remember what God did for them. And nine times in that book, he warns them not to forget. Why? Because that's what we're prone to do. And just to take the blessings of God in our lives for granted. David wrote Psalm 103. That's at least what the title says, and I believe it. And David lists six special personal benefits to you from God, from God's hand in verses three to five. Let's go through them quickly as possible. Let's go through them and see if you can identify with this. Verse three, don't forget his benefits. Here's the first one in, in uh, verse number three. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Don't forget the benefit of God in that he has given to us forgiveness. Forgiveness of sin. By the way, that word forgiveness or forgiveth is used only in the Bible of God's forgiving the sinner. Forgiving sinners. And the word iniquity in that third verse pictures sin as something that is twisted, something that is distorted and perverted. David knows something of this. When you read Psalm 32, where he talks about how God convicted him of his perversion, of his iniquity, of his sin. And then Psalm 51, when he breaks before the Lord and confesses and come, comes clean with God and enjoys the cleansing, the washing, the blotting out of that sin. Bless the Lord for his benefits than the first one and probably the biggest, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. He meets our sins with his marvelous forgiveness. Look at verses 10 through 14 with me. Again, we read these, but just think about them now even more deeply. Verse 10, he, that is God, hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. In other words, God has not given us justice. 
he took the justice on himself. God was justly punished instead of us. That's what we call substitution. Jesus took your place and mine on that tree, on that cross, and he suffered the just punishment of a sin-hating God instead of us in our place as our sinless, sin-bearing substitute, Jesus. And so as a result, God doesn't reward us as we justly deserve to be rewarded, which is punishment with eternally separation from God in a, in a burning hell that was originally created for the devil and his angels, the Bible says. But look at verse 11. For, as high, for, for the heaven is high above the earth, and so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as that, verse 12, east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Verse 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him, for he knows our frame. He knows we're dust. And he could blow us away. And so God's marvelous forgiveness here. Three comparisons in verse 11 through 13. First of all, the height, the height of God's forgiveness or mercy, you might say. It's overarching. It's overarching. It's like a, a universal flood that overarches everything. It's height. And then it's distance in verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, it's immeasurable. It's infinite. Where does the east end and the west begin? There is no dividing line. It's an infinite expanse. And so the distance in which God in his mercy has forgiven all our iniquities is infinite and our sins are irrecoverable as a result. And then the parent comparison in verse 13 and into verse 14. As a father pitieth or has compassion on his child. And the word pitieth there is a Hebrew word that comes from the same root word that the Hebrew word for a, a woman's womb comes from. Which gives you the idea that uh, our Heavenly Father's passion is mother-like love that he has even as a father for his children. So that's the first of six things that we should not forget God's benefit toward us who forgiveth all thy iniquities. Look at the second phrase in verse three, who healeth all thy diseases. He not only forgives, he heals. He's the healer. God's able to heal. <laughs> In fact, did you know that physical healing, not just spiritual, but physical healing is part of God's redemption plan? In Isaiah 53 and verse 4, it says that he took upon himself all of our grief. Literally, sickness is what it means. And all of our sorrows, that literally is pain. He took all our sickness and pain upon himself in his death on that tree. It's part of God's redemption plan. And Jesus, if you follow his ministry throughout the four Gospels, he's healing individuals and he's healing multitudes. He's healing them all that come to him for it. And in fact, I think it's significant that Matthew tells us in that gospel to the Jewish people, Matthew quotes Isaiah 53, 4, when Jesus is healing people as the fulfillment 
He is taking their sicknesses and he is healing their pain. That's in Matthew 8, 17. There's two extremes that I want you to remember and avoid here when it comes to God being the healer. First of all, the extreme that God heals all people all the time. If we buy into that, then we will be buying into a potential false hope, and I believe an imbalanced ministry. Because God doesn't always heal everyone all the time. If he did, no one would die who has ever asked God for healing. So the, the fact of the matter is, you have to have a balance here. Don't go to the extreme that God always heals. That could destroy people's faith when they aren't healed. And the fact of the matter is, when the disciples came back all enthused, the 70 came back and they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. You know what he said to them? Don't rejoice in your deliverance ministry, rather rejoice that your name is recorded in heaven. In other words, the salvation of souls is more important than the restoration of a body. Keep that balance. Here's the second extreme to avoid, and that is that God doesn't heal today, that there's no healing. If you take that attitude, you miss a lot of God's blessing. And you will rob God of his glory. I really believe that there is a balance, and the balance is found in James chapter 5 and verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders. And let the elders anoint him with oil and pray over him. And if he hath committed sins, they shall be forgiven and be healed. That's what James tells us. And I think that's a balanced approach. And it's simply this, believing prayer in the will of God, because God is ready for this. He is Yahweh Rapha, the Lord that heals. He's the healer. And we ought not to forget that benefit. God heals. There's a third benefit here. Drop down to verse four. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Don't forget God's ability to deliver. This is deliverance here. And I believe it is a reference to when God delivered Israel from Egypt in the Exodus through the Red Sea. But here it's an individual that he's talking about. It is God's rescue of someone that is about to fall into a pit. The word destruction refers to a pit. It refers to a pit that uh, the Bible would call Sheol, which is the grave. And so he is talking about God delivering people from the place of the, of the dead, God delivering people from physical death. Has God ever delivered you from physical death? Not just through healing your, your body, but through dangerous situations that perhaps you found yourself in, or maybe you put yourself in. God, I can think of numerous times where if everything, I, I should be dead, right? And, and I think you can too. But God redeemed my life from the pit from destruction. He delivered, and he delivers us from physical death. There are many occasions you don't even know about where God delivered you from physical death, where he protected you, and you had no clue that it was God's protection from the pit of destruction. Don't forget his benefits. Look for those things. Think back about the times that God spared your life when by all rights you should have been dead. And then praise him. Bless the Lord from with all of your being. Because you don't forget that he redeems your life from destruction. Look at verse 4 again. 
Here's another thing that we need to bless God for. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who crowns you. You know, crowns surround the head. God surrounds us. God, listen to this. Let me give you a picture to better understand this. God in the nation of Israel entered into a marriage covenant at Mount Sinai. This few days ago, the Jewish people, they celebrated Shavuot, and they were thinking back on when God brought them to Mount Sinai and gave them the law. At Mount Sinai, God entered into a marriage covenant with his people, Israel. And God was, he performed the, the function of a heavenly katan or groom. And Israel, they became God's kala, that is his beloved bride. And God's marriage covenant, his love in that marriage covenant, is expressed by what is said in this chapter to be mercy. It's God's chesed. And it refers to a marriage love that God has for his people. And that love that is formed within a very personal, intimate bond of sacred marriage is the, the, the covenant, that, that marriage covenant that encircles the life of God's people with constant tender mercies, as he says it here in that fourth verse. The loving kindness is the chesed, that married love that God has for his people. The tender mercies is a compassion. You know what it's saying here? Don't forget that Jesus is your lover. Jesus, remember there's a, there's a hymn by Charles Wesley in our hymn book, Jesus, lover of my soul. Your lover is Jesus. You are his bride. He is your bridegroom. If you're a believer, you are joined to him in a spiritual union and in a love that can never be broken. And that's why he crowns you. He surrounds you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Let that crown your head. Let that be the thing that surrounds your thinking. That you are in a special love relationship with the God of heaven. And that Jesus is the lover of your soul. And that he has joined himself to you and you to him. And it's a permanent bond. And he'll never divorce you. He'll never abandon or forsake you. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Look at verse 5. Here's another benefit you better not ever forget. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. Interestingly, that that word mouth is translated mouth here because it appears 14 times in the Hebrew Bible, and 11 of those 14 times, it's not translated mouth, only two times in the Hebrew mouth, 11 times it's translated ornaments or jewelry. He satisfies thy ornaments. What's he saying here? You're hungering for expensive material things. Guess what? If you haven't learned it now, learn it. Uh, if you haven't learned it yet, learn it now. And that is this that there is nothing in this life that the world will ever offer you that will satisfy your human soul. Us older people have figured that out by now, I hope. But you younger people, let me tell you, whatever you're coveting, maybe it's a, a relationship, a marriage relationship, maybe it's some material thing, maybe it's a, a financial for, a portfolio, whatever it might be, nothing that this world offers you in this life will ever satisfy that longing, that hunger in your human soul. 
as someone said, only Jesus can do that because he has created you and he made you with a God-shaped hole in your heart that he alone can fill. And you know what? That's what Jesus meant when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, by material things, by physical things, but by every word that proceeds out of... Man lives by a personal relationship with the God of heaven who speaks to his heart and man communes with God because nothing satisfies. That's why Jesus said, don't be like the pagans. Don't be like the nations of this earth that they all they do is seek after the things that they can find, all that the world offers. Don't be like them. Don't be like heathen people, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And guess what? Whatever you need will be taken care of. So get it right. Get a proper priority. Seek God and don't worry about the rest. You don't have to worry about the rest. You don't have to worry about a retirement account. If you're seeking God, he has promised to meet your needs and to take care of you. I'm not saying it's wrong to have that stuff, but if that's what you're trusting in, it's wrong. He satisfieth our mouth with good things. Let your conversation, and when the writer of Hebrews uses that word conversation, he means your lifestyle. Let your conversation, your lifestyle, be without covetousness and be content with such things. Are you content with your personal status? Are you content where you are in life today? Are you content with what you possess? Are you can let your life be without covetousness, not only money, but whatever else you want in life, because covetousness is idolatry. It replaces God with whatever you want. You want a husband? You want a wife? You want money? You want a house? You want a car? You want a job? You want a career? Name it. I mean, the list is endless. It's idolatry. He satisfies our mouth with good things. You know what God does? He fills our life with things that are good for us. And if you're missing something that you want, mark it down. God sees it. At least at this time, it's not good for you to have it. Or he'd have it. He fills our life with things that are good for us. He satisfies our physical needs and also our spiritual desires. That's what we are not to forget. And then he does so, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Here's another benefit that God gives us that we should never forget. We ought to take him up on it often. And that is he renews us. He renews our strength. He gives us fresh strength that will enable us to spiritually soar or glide even through old age. Isaiah 40 and verse 31, this reminds me of it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How? How does he renew our strength like a young person? How can he give an old person youthful strength? Well, he does so when we wait upon the Lord. That's what Isaiah says. We wait upon the Lord. You know what it means to wait upon the Lord? It means to look to him. It means to depend upon him. It means to change your utter weakness for God's strength. In fact, I contend that Isaiah 40, 31 is the Old Testament equivalent of Galatians 2, 20, which Hudson Taylor says is the exchanged life, where you exchange your weakness for God's strength and power and enablement. And that's what it means to renew your strength. And I'm telling you, if you'll do that, I don't care if you're in your 70s, 80s, 90s. You can have spiritual strength that enables you to soar like an eagle. 
in your life if you're looking to him, if you're depending upon him, if you're taking your weak inability and you're casting it on him. You know, I was thinking about it this week. Believers, when they when they get saved, they learn to cast their sins on the Lord. But how many believers have cast their sins on the Lord, but failed to cast their cares on the Lord? And so they live burdened lives that God never intended them to live. They don't know anything about the exchange life. Look, if you haven't learned it yet as a believer, time has come for you to learn it. I came across a fable, fable that is told about an eagle that thought he was a chicken. When the, and this is why. When the eagle was very small, he fell from the safety of his nest, and a chicken farmer found him and brought the eagle to his farm and raised him in the chicken coop among the other chickens. And the eagle grew up doing what chickens do, living like a chicken, believing he was a chicken. And a biologist came by one day, and uh, he heard about this eagle that was acting like a chicken. He wanted to check it out, see if it was really true. He knew that an eagle was the king of the sky, and so he was surprised when he saw this eagle strutting around the chicken coop, pecking at the ground, acting just like a chicken. The farmer explained to the biologist that this bird's no longer an eagle. He's now a chicken because he's been trained to be a chicken. And he believed he was a chicken. But the, bio the, the biologist knew that there was, there was more to this great bird than what he was doing at that moment. And uh, that he was pretending to be a chicken. So the biologist took the eagle and he lifted him onto the fence surrounding the chicken coop. And he said, eagle, you're an eagle. Stretch forth your wings and fly. And the eagle moves slowly only to look at the man. And then he glanced down at the barnyard and jumped among the chickens where he was comfortable. The farmer said, see, I told you he was a chicken. The biologist returned the next day and he tried to convince the farmer that this was an eagle and not a chicken and it was born for something greater. He took the eagle that day to the top of the, the barn roof and he spoke, eagle, you're an eagle. You belong to the sky. Spread your wings and fly. And the large bird looked at the man and then he looked down into the chicken coop and he jumped from the man's arms onto the barn roof, and then down into the coop again. Knowing what eagles are really about, the biologist asked the farmer, will you let me try just one more time? So he returned the next day to prove that this bird was an eagle. And the farmer convinced, what was convinced otherwise, the farmer said, I told you, it's a chicken. But the biologist came, and he took the eagle and the farmer some distance away from the from a farm up to the foot of a high mountain and they couldn't see the farm nor the chicken coop from this new setting and so the man held the eagle on his arm and he pointed to the sky where the bright sun was beaming down and he said eagle you're an eagle you belong to the sky not to the earth stretch your wings and fly and this time the eagle stared skyward into the bright sun. He straightened his body, stretched his massive wings, and moved slowly at first, and then surely and powerfully, and with the, a mighty screech of an eagle, he flew. When you're born again, when you're born of God, he gives you his life. He himself, the resurrection and the life lives in you and makes you more than a conqueror. Why, after all this time, are you still stuck in the barnyard, pecking at the ground, grumbling and angry and irritable and impatient and rebellious and unthankful when you were made to soar? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his 
holy name. Say it with me. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Let's bow in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you have intervened in, in the lives of people who have put their faith and trust in you alone. You have made us your own. Your life is in us. And we are not earthbound. We are heaven. We are heaven bound. We're citizens of heaven. In fact, we're told in the Bible that those that are Christ are seated in the heavenlies already in Christ, who is our head. For that reason, Lord, I pray that you would wake up the chickens in this assembly. You would wake up the chickens in your church. And Lord, give them a sense of the, the victory, the conquering power, the resurrection life of Jesus that resides in them if they have been born of God, if they've been born again. They have your life. You are in them. Wake them up, Lord. Wake up the chickens. Wake them up before it's too late and they waste their lives pecking at the ground when they should be soaring above with Christ in them the hope of glory. Lord, we just ask that you would uh, cause the truth of these many benefits to continue to echo in our minds and hearts that we would not forget you all your benefits, that we would, we would revel in them. We would rejoice in them. We would praise you as this psalm tells us to because of who you are and because of what you do. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, I wonder if there's someone here today that you've never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior. By that I mean, do you know where you will spend eternity when you die? And if you have any doubt, we'd love to help settle those doubts in your heart today. If you don't know for sure, 100%, that you're saved and on your way to heaven, then please speak to me or someone that you know can show you from God's word how you can be born again, please. And if you are born again, forget not all his benefits. Rejoice in who you are and what Christ is in you and does through you.